ready to start my podcast, and I started out with a song. Well, what are you talking about a podcast? You do a podcast? That's right. You do a podcast. Do it every week. It's about heavy metal and hard rock and heavy metal news. That sounds fun. Join me on this lovely day for another podcast, I must say. It's going to be fun, lots of news, lots of good things to do. really digging the cut of your butter, man. I gotta say, I think I might tune into that podcast, you will? And sing this last bit. I think I'll listen to Shane's podcast. I think I'll do it right now. I think it might be a blast. It's gonna be a really, really good time. I'm gonna shut my damn mouth so we can stop that thing right now. That was award-winning. That was award-winning. Sometimes they just come out. They just come out magically. It's like a gift. And then some days, well, we don't talk about those days, right? We don't talk about the bad days. You want to talk more about the good days, right? In your life, instead of talking about everything that's miserable in your life, you talk about the good things that's in your life, and it makes you a happier person for that. Uh, and if I can be any part of that, well, then welcome, welcome, one and all, back to Jive Talking 136. I've checked the comments. That's right. We do them every show. Uh, at the end of every show, we check in with your comments. And uh, before, now that I'm thinking about the comments, they're ready to go. Miss Althea, we're all good. I see read more, read more, read more. Now, here's the thing. Miss Althea had some great advice. And I'm going to start doing this at every, every episode. This is a no request zone. That's right. The Jive Talking with Shane Diablo uh, comment sections are a no request zone. Uh, every other video I put out on the internet, you can you can put your requests all over in there, but here I want to, I want to hear from you. I want to hear your thoughts and opinions. That's important to me to listen to what you have to say about things. It doesn't even have to be about things about the bands or 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 anything. It could be any old damn thing that you want to you want to give to me. Uh, so much news we're not going to be talking about, but we've got plenty here. Um, Lita Ford's putting out a new record, and it's going to be a concept record. That's weird to me, right? Testament's back in the studio. They're working on new work. Wednesday 13, he's back in the studio. He's making a new album. Uh, so much going on, but we've got plenty of good stuff here, I think. I think I've picked a batch of stories that at least piqued my interest. So let's do it right now. Well, you know who this fella is? That's Nikki Six. What was his real name? And didn't he, I vaguely remember him stealing the name. Like he was dating a girl that had the name Nikki Six. And he wrote her, a, and like he found a letter that was laying on the floor in a room going, baby, I just, just break, I just, I swear I'll get a job. Just let me move back into the apartment. And it said, dear, I love you, Nikki Six. And then he took the name. Uh, but Nikki Six is he's open to the the avatars. Remember when Kiss did that at the final show and they said they're immortal and they're going to be lasting forever? Well, Nikki Six is is open to that idea, uh, and so we're going to get into it. Nikki Six is open to the Motley Crue avatars when the time is right. We got to we want to get up there in the ages of Kiss before we get thinking about that. Let's see what he says in a new interview with Jane in in and Force, the Swedish radio station Rockalasikir. Did I nail that? Rockalasic here. Motley Crue bassist Nikki Six was asked for his opinion on Gene Simmons, Paul Stanley, that is the, the Demon Man and the Star Child, uh, announcement that Kiss will live on eternally as a digital avatar created by Abba Voyager. We know this. And he said this is what he had to say about it. He says, uh, you know, I love technology. I love it. I think as long as it's coming from an artist that says, hey, I have something I want to do. This technology is going to help. Like Motley Crue latest uh, video, Dogs of War, for that song, Dogs of War, we put out. When I think of our video first, I don't know how much. What? When I think of our first video, I don't know how much. The video may cost $1,000. There was there was no MTV at the time. So it was like... Uh, uh, how could we shoot a video that we that when they talk about us on the news when we tour? Am I reading that, Goofy? We used to have a lot of local news stations 
that would promote artists coming through town. Comedians, country rock, rock, whatever. So we wanted to have a calling card. That's smart. That's business. Mm-hmm. That's that's business. Now now we they, they forgot a space here. Okay, so we know that's and we, but we can say and we. That's kind of the French version of that, if you'd like. But and we were lighting me on fire on stage at the ta at the time of Mick Mars, Motley Crue guitarist, puked up some blood. That might have been his real stuff. And it was just like fuck. It. Let's just throw everything in there. Uh, wasn't there a flaming sword in there too? I want to say, and that was that. We did, uh, we did to get what that, and that is what we did to get fans to see what we want to be represented as. The same as Dogs of War. Jesus, I don't know if I'm reading that weird or if it's just coming out weird or what. I don't know what the future holds. We did some stuff with holograms years ago, but before the technology was really fleshed out some point we're not going to be here anymore i mean not to be a debbie downer but it's just not going to happen and how great for your band or where, whatever it is that you do to be able to go forward for generations and generations so i think when the time is right put us in a coffin and fire up those avatars ah, 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 ah. motley Crew's latest song, Dogs of War, was made available April 26th via the band's new label. Vince Neil set that up because he lives in Tash Ten Nashville, Tennessee, so he set the record deal up, I think, with Big Machine Records, the Dogs of War. Music video is an uh, animated, all-CGI affair directed by Nick Denbor. That's enough of that. We got The Paul Man. You, 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 man, I'm telling you what, if Nikki Six says his name aloud, there he is. Hey, what's up? What's up, everybody? He likes to, he pierces those lips together. Is that what you call that? Piercing, pinching, pursing? Because he forgets he doesn't have that makeup on. And he always had to be doing that when he had the makeup on. So even when he's got it off, he still pierces his lips like that. But Paul Stanley, I was convinced, I was so convinced I could play the guitar when I had no knowledge of the guitar. So what he's saying is he felt it spiritually. Before he'd even picked up a guitar and he was watching old Elvis Presley on the on on TV shaking his hips. And Paul was going, I feel like I can play that. That thing that he's strumming on, Mama. I think I can do it. In the latest episode of Gibson TV, The Collection, Host Mark Agnesy, Ag Agnesy, is that uh, Adam Agnesy, uh, the the t tennis player? Is that his brother, Mark Agnesy? Is in the Kiss warehouse to explore Paul Stanley's impressive guitar collection. Kiss is an American icon. They have sold over 100 million records, earning them more gold records than any other band in history. And Stanley was at the front and center of all of it. He has toured the globe for nearly 50 years with one of the most influential rock bands in, in the world. So you know he has a guitar collection that is made for loving. Oh, I see what they did there. I was made for love. He better say that. He better get in there and say, Paul, I was made for love in your band room. Does he, he polishes all the guitars, right? He doesn't leave them dirty. Paul's not a dirty boy. He's not going to leave his guitars all dirty laying around the room and go, there, there they are. They're all on the floor there. He's going to keep them on the walk in the cases and stuff, or he's got a houseboy to do that, I'm sure. Join Agnesy at Kiss Warehouse to get a personal tour of his impressive collection of guitars from the star child himself in this new Ebsen of Gibson TV, The Collection episode. Watch as Stanley shares some of his favorite Gibson Les Paul guitars. Shows us what he regards as his best-sounding guitar. In the form of his Corina Flying V and reflects on the importance of being a great rhythm guitar player. A skill, and he was. 
right? He was a solid. He was a solid rhythm man like Malcolm Young. A skill he honed over decades of performing. Here are the stories for his first SG Les Paul, the heartbreaking, the heartbreak of losing vintage burst Les Pauls. The story of his mirrored Ibanez PS10 signature guitar. You want to know about that? And his his newest edition, a custom shop 1961 Les Paul SG standard. Not the fucking bullshit kind. It's the standard. It's not the 1961 Les Paul SG whatever. Empty, blank. It's the standard. Asked when guitars first showed up on his radar when he put when, when he went, oh, I want to do that. I was just debating over if I was doing Paul's voice there. Asked about his first guitar showing his radar and when he went on, oh, I want to do that. That's what I want to do. When was the first time, Paul? That's the way I would have said it. Paul, how you doing? When was the first time that you knew, you says, I got to do that? When was that? That's what I would have done. When? When I was a kid, I saw Eddie Cochran on TV. I was close. Oh, shit. I see Elvis Presley here. For some reason... He seemed like an even more dangerous, he seemed even more dangerous than Elvis Presley. There was something about him and that rogue and seemed ruthless. Yeah, it wasn't Eddie Cochran. What tune did they do? Summertime blues. Is that, that? Uh, there was something about him. There was rogue, it seemed ruthless. Great attitude, summertime blues, and come on, everybody. So that was really the start of my introduction to the guitar. Although I grew up in a family with a lot of folk music and bluegrass and opera, classic music. All of them, Paul? They were all, all of those were going on? I don't think so. Your brother ain't listening to folk music in one room and, and classical opera in the other. Okay? Someone's fighting over the record machine. That old kind with the horn on it. Gotta crank it up. I was convinced I could play the guitar when I had no knowledge of the guitar. Just because there was some sort of connection, guitar really is the instrument of the blues, which gave birth to rock and roll. God gave birth to rock and roll. Paul, don't you remember? Why are you blaming it on the blues when it was God that gave you rock and roll? If anyone ever wonders, this is exactly how I read my phone, the newspaper, anything. I swear. That's why it's so fun. I can hang out with you guys. You can tell me what you think of the book. And I can just sit here and read the stories that I wanted to catch up on. Because I'm a busy man during the week. I've got things to do. Overworked, underpaid. You know the story. Asked when he finally got his hands. When did you get those little little dirty fingers on a guitar, Paul? Oh, gosh. I kept telling my parents, my 13th birthday was coming up, Mama and Daddy. I keep saying, I really want a guitar, an electric guitar. Right around my birthday, my mama said, Look under your bed, huh, dear? Look, look under your bed. And I, I looked under my bed, and my heart began to break because I saw this big cardboard case. Don't be a needy bugger. What's the phrase for that when you say you, you get what you get? And I pulled it out, and I opened it up, and it was a used nylon string guitar. I was shattered. Because you can't play rock and roll on this. <clears throat> what do you think Elvis was doing there, Paul? What's he been doing with it? I don't even think I ever saw Elvis Presley with an electric guitar on. That would look weird and wrong. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Le 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 something about his bed. He puts it. Uh, let's see. So he's very upset about it, right? It's a big cardboard case, and I pulled it out. I opened it up. I saw it was a nylon string guitar. I was shattered because I, I can't play rock and roll on this. And I closed it, and I pushed it back under the bed. A couple of months later, that's how long I left it under there. I didn't even look at that damn box again for a couple of months, and this was Christmas Day. Or, no, it's my birthday. 
I closed it up, pushed it under the bed. A couple of months later, I said, let me, let me give that a go. That's what it says there, guys. Let me, let me give that a go. So, that was really the start. It was nylon string guitar. I was probably 13 years old. Of course you were. It was your birthday. It was your 13th birthday, remember? I took it to a really, I took to it really quickly. I took a few lessons. I wanted to go faster. That's what they do every damn time, Miyagi. They want to get right to the punching and the slapping and the kicking to the face. That's exactly what they do. They don't want to learn the technique. They want to get right to it. I took a few lessons. I wanted to go faster. And for some reason, the teacher was, no, you have to stay at this pace. So we went, and the guitar stayed. Oh, boy. All right, well, we're done with that, I guess. We got to, guys, we got to get done with pierced lips here, okay? Because uh, uh, Lars, James Hetfield's going to weigh in because they're asking the question, is Lars Ulrich playing the best drums in the last 20 years? I really feel like he is. So James Hetfield weighs in. That's what it says. Is Lars Ulrich playing some of his best shows in 20 years? James Hetfield, he weighs in. During an appearance on the recent episode, he never does the Eddie Trunk, do they? I just learned that there's like some people that hate him and some people that love him. Who was on that list? I almost feel like it was a YouTube video or a documentary or something on all the people that don't like Eddie Trunk. Is, it, is, is Metallica one of them? You sons of bitches. Lars Ulrich, you're not going to go on Eddie's trip. What, what's he ever done to you? Or maybe he is friends with Metallica. I do feel like it's something. Anyways, for whatever reason, I th there's a bunch of people that don't like Eddie, Eddie Trunk. They won't go on his show. Rock stars. They go, fuck it. I don't like it. I take back everything I've said about Metallica not liking him in case that's I have infringed on a lie. During an appearance on the recent episode of the Metallica Report, that is the official podcast, offering weekly insider updates of all things Metallica, Metallica frontman James Hetfield, he sat down, was asked if he would agree that Lars Ulrich is probably playing some of the best gigs he's played in well over a decade, if not 20 years on the ongoing M72 tour. James responded as, Yeah, nothing else matters. I'd say that the, this tour in general, the last two years, we've been building it up, building up to it. He's, he's an optimist. He's, he's going he's gonna to say this in a very eloquent way. Absolutely, absolutely playing great. I hope he's having fun. And he's not too worried about his playing. He's not. Because he would let his emotions take just take him. Now, he's a little more concerned about the click track and playing along with it, being solid. It's, it's not easy to do. I'll, I'll give you that. I'll tell you that. It's not one thing that people don't understand. You're like, well, Shane, you're a drummer. And you got beat, so click, click, click. But it's just, there's a whole new kind of set in your brain that needs to connect in to get to that point that you can enjoy the song while you play it but also hear that click it's got it that click has to end up somewhere in the back of your head and by the way it slows down every song every song that you're like this needs to be punchier and faster it's like now nope. turn it down turn it slow down um let's see uh let's see i hope he's having fun out there oh jeez uh, me too but yeah, yeah, I think as a group, we are all playing really, really good, really tight. There's something uh, appealing, and I don't know why this is, but if you get on, uh, I would say YouTube more often than anything else, but the YouTube shorts, and you look up James Hetfield smoking cigars or whatever, there's something tranquil about that dude sitting in that chair and, you know, that intro that they have. <laughs> And he's just token on a cigar, and you can see in that guy's eyes, he is, he says, man, I am, he's very self-aware. And he's like, 
he takes in the experience of where he is at at that very moment. He's sitting there smoking that cigar, and you can just see appreciation in his face and eyes. Look them damn things up. You'll and get in the comments and tell me if I'm right or if I'm telling lies. Uh, let's see. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Really good. And it doesn't scare me, but I don't mind fucking things up. It's fun. There's still mistakes, or not mistakes, but there's still unique moments that happen. This, I'm telling you, this dude is on it. He understands. He's self-aware. He's in the moment. He's, he, he, he takes each and every step and every little thing he does step by step and enjoys every bit of it. I'm telling you. And it's good. We don't want to, that freaking polished machine up there at all. So no matter how practiced, no, no, practiced, and they do practice every gig, no matter how good we think we're doing, there's still stuff that happens. It's what happens when you're doing a live band. Three years ago, Lars told Metallica's So What fan club magazine that he is no longer bothered by people's criticisms of his drumming abilities. At the time, the Danish-born musician said, unlike years ago, I basically don't read any of their, uh, the interviews that the guy, other guys in Metallica do so, or 30 years ago. Uh, we are uh, sit a fucking read, read every page of the Kerrang. We don't sit and read every page of the Kerrang, every page of Circus Magazine. Those are gone now, bud. Are they gone? I, I bought religiously. Kerrang, Circus Magazine, Hit Parader. Religiously, every month. And Rip. There was a, I mean, I had some episodes, issues of rip, but you know, I, you, you had your real metal friends. You know, the Voivod dudes, they had rip, they had them all. Oh, you, you fucking don't have rip? Oh, okay, it's interesting. And there were some other ones out there too, weren't there? Get in the comments and tell me all the, mag the great heavy metal magazines of the 80s. Um. A circus magazine and what so and so saying and what the other members are saying, what James Hetfield, guitarist, was saying about this and that. Now there's just none of that. I also don't read what people are saying about Metallica. I'll say that occasionally, once every six months or something like that, it's kind of fun to go through the trolling section just because the ridiculousness of it all. But it's not something that I do regularly anymore. 20 years ago, it would have been, oh my God, somebody said something bad, or that person said a nasty comment in this comment section, or whatever. Now, none of that really means anything to me. Good on you, buddy. Just you be you. I saw a video. I did see a video, and I had a bit of this trouble. There's a video where he's supposed to be doing some serious double basing, and I noticed his left leg you know, he would pull it off the pedal. He was not doing it. It was sounding like whatever, but he was not doing it. And there's this thing that happened to my muscle in my leg where it was, I, it would just tighten up and I could not keep going. And it's because you're not properly drumming. You're not properly using your ankles and toes and, and tips and, and stuff. He's not playing properly and never has played properly. And the reason I know that is because I play a lot like him. A lot better. But I played a lot like him. Big arms, big legs, big movements and stuff like this. And if you watch them badasses, it's all, it, you, you know, like a, a Eloy. He uses his arms. He's a hard, hard hitter, but it's all technique in his fingers and wrists. That's how you get speed rolls. That's how you get all that stuff. Anyways, we're done with that shit. I don't want to hear it. Andrew Kisser. This is Sepultra guitar player. Okay? He's a guy with Max Cavalera. Remember we did a story about Max Cavalera saying, hey, you know, uh, there might be a reunion. Well, Andrew Kisser, he says, nature responded. When we change course and abuse, and well, this is what I thought was interesting about this, this article because the way I'm reading it, it says, nature responded. A Andrew Kisser says, nature responded when we change course on abuse of environment during pandemic. Now, what I'm taking away from that is, and maybe I'm reading it completely wrong, but he's saying the environment was what they sang about 
the abuse of the environment during the pandemic changes course. I don't know. Guys, I'm, my brains are fried. I don't know what that means. I'll, be, I'll tell you right now. I don't, I don't understand any of that. But what I think he's going to say is perhaps we can do something. At a press conference during last weekend's Hellfest in Clisson, France, Sepultura guitarist Andrew Kisser spoke about his involvement with Savage Lands. That's a good band. The nonprofit organization, never mind, it's not a band. The non, but there is a good band called Savage Lands, I believe. The nonprofit organization, founded by Megadeth drummer Dirk Verburen, really, and his partner Sylvain. Dem Demer Castle, you better marry that girl, boy, whatever it is. Hey, you better marry him. Just get that last name out of there, that Demer Castle. Get that out. They're both tongue twisters, but I'll go with Verburen. Launched into 2022 to help finance forest restoration projects and purchase land in order to preserve natural forests that would otherwise be threatened. Savage lands, this is wonderful. Savage Land's mission is amplified by a series of singles featuring members of the metal community, including Kisser, obituaries John Tardy, members of Hell Lung, we've done them, and Chloe Trujillo, the wife of Metallica bassist Robert Trujillo. Well, they got some big pockets over there in Metallica land. Get them, get your wallet out, Metallica. Kisser said, Under lockdown during the pandemic, we all remember when no planes, no cars, no pollution, no construction. You, you, you see how nature responded so quickly. The air got better. Animals started to get out there for the hiding places. Where they hide, they hide in the woods. They hide everywhere. When the people and the noise and the construction and the sound, they hide. Uh, animals started to get out of their hiding places. You see, the nature is very alive and very aware. We don't let that happen. We don't let that that happen. So we need to find a way to embrace nature instead of fucking destroying and construction and stuff like that. So, it is a proof on the lockdown. And it is possible that why there is hope that it's possible that nature will respond very quickly if we change our ways of dealing with it. That should be a goddamn poster. I agree. Kisser, who performed at Hellfest with Savage Lands, band and group, as part of a lineup that included Shane Embry... Napalm Death. Vincent Dennis, Body Count. Is that the bass player? Daniel DeJong, Textures. Oh, I can't say that name. Siljay Warland, The Gathering. And Jesper Liverod, Nasim. Nasim. Oh, you got more here? Alejandro Montoya, Culture Tres. And Chloe Trujillo. She's all over the place. She just gets up there. They say, oh, what do you do for a living? I'm my my dad. I, I do the merch. It's Savage Lions and merch. Oh, Chloe Trujillo went on to speak. Or no. No, oh, don't let it be her. And Chloe, and Chloe Trujillo went on to speak about the heavy metal community's increasing support in, for environmental causes. Thrash was all about that back in the day. Every thrash band had at least 10 songs that was about the environment. The oil spills, the place we live, it seems that we don't give a damn. Uh, let's see. Get yourself a Diet Coke and put it in the comments if you know what that was that I just did. Okay? Uh, we should let all the musicians in the We should let all the musicians in the scene know that this is happening. A lot of people, some musicians, come and, and want to be part. Some other musicians have to pay attention to, kind, to, to this kinds of stuff. And there's a lot of friends. I mean, the amount of people that are already here today. We have Sepultra, Napalm Death, The Gathering Body Count, Culture Trace. There's a lot of stuff involved. 
Many different ways of seeing metal or aggressive music. Uh, aggressive music, if you will. But all with the purpose. It's a fantastic movement. And it's growing, like I said. It's just beginning. Uh, so the metal community slowly will be more aware of this. And hopefully, we can make this bigger. During their hour-long set, Hellfest of the Savage Lands performed classic metal songs. Uh, so is this not going to mention anything about that he's going to say anything about uh, uh, this keeps going on? Uh, I thought he might mention a little something about... Uh, guys, I love trees, okay? Don't get me wrong. I love trees. I love nature. I love all of that stuff. I can do about a day and a half of camping. Three days is a lot. I used to go camping with my best friends, and I, we did it every year. And I was wonderful. Every blessed moment, every every moment was bless, a blessed one out there, okay? But about a day and a half in, I'll fucking, uh, I just fucking go. And my and my and God love them. The people that I'm with, my friends that are there, they fucking they've had their shoes off the whole week. Oh, we 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 popped in three days earlier, uh, and they haven't put their shoes on five days. I mean, I love you people like that. I love you, okay? Don't get me wrong, but. It's just a lot for me. Uh, they sang the song No Remedy, which is uh, hell long in my France and yeah, all that. Okay, let's move on. Blackie Lawless, because he's going to tell us about a stinky. He, he said he wanted to do a stinky. And so I just wanted to get into what he was talking about here. There he is. Look, big and strong, standing there with his strong back when it was strong. But he'll get strong again. He'll get it back there. Wasps. Blackie Lawless wanted to write a... Heavy, nasty, stinky rock and roll record. But that's not what is coming out. Nothing, that's not what's coming out. The big, nasty, stinky is not what's coming out. You have a way with words, Mr. Lawless. I will, I'll give you that. Or Blabbermouth. They may have wrote that... That, but I don't think so. I think that's 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 what he's going to get into here. Uh, we also have a, uh, uh, another thing coming up here, and then we're going to get into your comments. Aren't you so happy you've made it this far? You should be proud of yourself. I'm I'm proud of you. If you can hang, welcome, welcome to the Goon Squad. Welcome. In a recent interview with Meltdown of Detroit's WRIF radio station, Wasp frontman Blackie the Black Man Lawless. No. Blackie the Blackest of Lawlesses. Was asked about the progress of writing uh, songwriting sessions of the band's long-awaited follow-up to 2015's Golgotha album. As transcribed, he said, as transcribed by Blubbermouth, we still are working on it. What happened? Is he going to be your back? When we came back from Europe's tour, Euro our European tour, I had to have surgery and stuff. And a, and a year prior to that, we had been working on a, a lot of new stuff. And when I came back, I, I, I've had a long time to go through those early demos and what I've been working on, listening to it with fresh ears, dare I say. So, some of it's really good, but there's, well, there's not enough of it yet where I would be comfortable in saying, okay, this is finished, and let's go with it. I'd like to go back and visit the drawing board, so to speak, and see what else is there. Because even from two, even from a two-year period, of when we started working on the that before to where we are right now, you're going to gain so much. You're going to grow so, 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 so very much. I've learned you don't make records or do makeup or don't make records anymore that are spread out there over two or three year period. Because the guy you are when you first make it is not the guy you are when you finish making it. Get in. Six months, top to bottom. Get that thing cranked up. Because like I said, if you don't, 
you end up running the risk of it kind of being a schizophrenic type of record, where you've got one type of one thing, and then there's half of it is something else, and it has no real cohesiveness. Asked what kind of stuff he's inspired, stuff inspires him. Now, in 2024, Black said, well, when we got ready to start this record a couple of years ago, my mindset was I wanted to do a heavy, nasty, stinky rock and roll record. And that's where my heart was at. Now, it's not dirty and stinky no more, but when I start, it's, you got went on that tour. See, that's when the, your, your, your Christian flavor starts to go down. You say, tell me again how old she was. That gal, that young goth gal that just passed by, how old was she? So you got, so you're thinking, you're out there on the road thinking dirty, stinky. I want to write me a dirty, stinky rock record. You get back home, you say, and your wife's there going, where have you been? You were supposed to be back a week ago, Mr. Lawless. You're like, hi, 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 hi. I was out with the boys, honey. I, I told you I was. But when I started to write, that's not what came out. So when you first start the process, you think, okay, well, go along with whatever comes out to begin with. But I want to try to start steering this ship in a different direction as time goes by. And that's just not what is happening. It was stuff that was more in-depth. Uh-oh. And I thought we did call Golgotha. That's one of those... What? And I thought, we did call Golgotha, that's one of those things, Think that's one of those thinking man's records. Okay, so what he's saying here, with all this gibberish that I'm saying badly, is that Golgotha is a thinking man's record. And I thought, I don't want to do this time. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I want to do something that's a little lighter. Like I said, a little nasty, stinky, old-time rock and roll. But as hard as I was trying to force it in that direction, it's not what was happening. Now, when we get done with this tour, and the European tour next year, then it'll be time to start looking at those again in, in earnest. So, who knows where we'll come to at it again? So who knows where we'll come out at it again? To give you an honest answer, and are you, at, are you, are you needing an honest answer right now? I need a crystal ball right now to tell you that to tell you that, because I don't know. I need a goddamn crystal ball right now to tell you that, because you're asking me in honest. Last November, Blackie Lawless addressed the high musical standards of Wasp's most recent album, telling Canada's The Metal Voice, nobody makes money making records anymore. So, if you're going to make a re records now, you're doing it because of your legacy. And if you're going to do that, then you really have to make sure that it's strong as it can be. Because it al it's always going to be measured against what you did to begin with. Well, you know what they say. You got your whole life to start your first record. You only got a year to write your next. It gets hard. So you want to thank those people that can write those songs. Or you want to thank those people that have met people that can write those songs. You know, ghosts in that business now, where he's like farming out and collecting stuff and saying, Ooh, I like the sound of that. Go ahead, how much you want for it? 25,000? Bang, it's yours. You know, you got it, you know. Thank goodness for bands that can write music and keep continuing to put out great records and write music. And to those great bands and people out there that use other writer, songwriters and collect those songs and give them dividends to create great music. Either way. Speaking of great music, Anthrax. This is the last story, guys, then we get into your, your comments. Anthrax, Madhouse, 
gets a mention in Stephen King's new book. Now, this isn't the new book, other new book that I'm reading. This is another book. Or maybe it could be because I am now seven chapters over eight hours into the book. And if you're paying attention to Jive Talking, you know what the deal is with this, with the guy, with the, the old man, the broken leg, the kid, ah, helps him, gets him to the hospital, creepy thing at the house. Eight hours into this book, the old man has just returned home. Still hasn't checked the shed, heard the scratching and chirping and going, what the hell's in there? Still hasn't bothered with it one bit. Eight hours in, guy is just getting home. They're going, oh, fine. yes, let's take a look at this couch. Oh, I think he'll do fine here because he can't make his way because of his broken leg up to his bedroom upstairs. So I believe that this couch, although shoddy, will do what... Anthrax gets a mention in the new Stephen King book. Let's see if it's the same one, and I can look forward to that on page. I think he writes books just so he can go, my book's this big. I took my penis out one night, and I got it erect, and I says, I'm going to hunt deer, deer. She says, I've got a headache. He says, no, I'm just telling you. I'm going to write a book that's just as high to the tippy top. Pardon me for going X-rated there. Anthrax Madhouse got a mention in legendary master of horror Stephen King's latest co collection of stories, You Like It Darker. I should be reading that one. I should be audiobooking that one because it's short stories. You guys ever heard that? You ever read or listened to anything from Chuck Palahniuk? God damn, that guy's disgusting. He's the guy that did Fight Club. Uh, I love his books, but man, he's he gets he gets he's bizarre. He gets into some bizarre stuff. Uh, but there's those writers out there; they can just cut the mustard. You know, it's like they can, in a few sentences they can put an image in your mind, and you go, "Oh, they've just literally described a whole vision to me." And then there's other writers that need eight hours to basically tell you. This kid's a good boy. This kid that's going to help this old man that has something in the garage is a good boy. Anyways, guys, sorry for the terror. My God. Anthrax, it gets that mention. According to Anthrax, Scott Ian, he didn't read that book. The song from the band's second album, 1985, Spreading the Disease, was brought up in a rather brutal tale called Thin which is the fifth of a dozen short works of found, found, pardon me, within You Like It Darker. The story was first published on Scribd on May 25th, 2022 as an ebook exclusive, but received a wider release, okay, tell me more, in physical form this past May through Simon & Schuster imprint Scribner. They don't own Scrib, do they? Ian took straight to his Instagram. <laughs> Stephen fucking King name checks us again in his new collection of fucking heart of stories. You like it, darker? I was reading on a flight home from Europe yesterday, and in a fish story in a fucking book. I read a brutal tale called Finn. Steve uses our song Madhouse as a torture device. Perfect. I apologize if the sound of, uh, of my head exploding when I saw Anthrax mention woke anyone up on this plane. Oh, okay. I didn't know where that was going. It was fucking perfect. I apologize if the sound of my head exploding when I saw Anthrax mention woke up anyone on that plane. If you haven't read You Like It Darker, let me tell you something, you fucking son of a bitch. I recommend you do. It's a vicious summer read. Well, what's it say? Something about Among the Living. Guys, we love that record, okay? Anthrax's third studio album, Among the Living, was so heavily inspired by Stephen King's epic The Stand 
Interesting. Huh. Don't you just love a good nugget of information? You just file it right back there in your head and you go, wow. Ian was asked to write a foreword for one, for, for one edition of the book. The album track, A Skeleton in the Closet, is also inspired by the novella, Apt Pupil. Well, which was part of the Different Seasons collection. I thought I was going to say Different Strokes. Uh, King previously referenced Anthrax in The Dark Tower's third book, and I, lis I listened to all them, guys. I could, I could, I mean, I was even speaking the lingo of the gunslinger there for a while. So let me see if this rings a bell with me. The Wastelands. Anthrax cover of Trust's Antisocial was also featured in a fight scene in 2017's It adaptation. Do I remember that? It's a madhouse. <laughs> and this little guy right over here, Frank Bello, he just went out there. Here's something that'll twist your, your brains up. He was, he's filling in on bass for Satyricon, black metal band. You go, buddy. Jeez. This guy right here, he's in fucking Pantera. This guy over here is in Mr. Bungle. And this guy right here is the greatest damn journey singer you're ever going to know in your life. And I apologize if, you don't, if you're not watching the video and you just don't know where my little mousy guy's pointing over their faces. You're going to have to go figure that out for yourself. It is time for your comments. Uh, the best part of the podcast, in my opinion. And, let's, and we're going to do it right now. Mike Buchanan right there. I know there's Reed Moores. I'm happy about it. We're all good to go. Well, here we go again. Another week... Uh, you, you lost a K there. Maybe he's busy. He's sitting there at the, in the swimming pool with the fireworks going off and a hot dog. And he missed that K. Well, here we go. Another week, another movie. Movies that are bad, but we love them anyways. The Black Scorpion, 1957. Horror Fest continues. The Black Scorpion, an old 50s monster movie about volcanoes erupting and freeing giants, subterranean scorpions... Gigantic, sorry, Jesus, erupting and freeing gigantic subterranean scorpions. The special effects were all superior for the time for the time period. Turns out that all of the giant scorpions are led, are, are led by an even bigger, more gigantic black scorpion. There's even more bigger scorpions. This giant king scorpion begins killing everything in sight, even the other scorpions. It pulverizes them and then eats them. It soon turns its attention towards humans. I've ate all the bugs. Now I need flesh. And goes on a killing spree. So, for a while... It was actually a giant subterranean cannibal black scorpion. My God. Then it reverted to human blood, and pretty much blood of any kind. At the end, the army lures the black scorpion into a football stadium, that's where you do it, by using a huge pile of dead cows. That's brilliant. They drop the nuke on it. Overall, the black scorpion was a bad movie. It is a very campy, very surreal, and at times very cheesy. I was wondering about the word cheesy the other day. What happened to it? It's a perfectly good word. No one uses cheesy anymore, except for this guy. Uh, let's see. Uh, very surreal, and at times very cheesy, which I love. Grab your favorite beverage. Sit in your favorite chair. Pop some popcorn and Press play. All right, Buchanan on his thoughts. This is where we go into his brain pan and we look around. We use a spoon and we kind of just move things around. I would say that most people in the metal world would say that Operation Mindcrime is the best concept album or maybe King Diamond's Abigail. He might be close to something. Or possibly them. 
He got mine. But to me, okay, so he's just throwing them around. And, and you're right on the money about Operation Minecrime. I bet you the majority of people would say that, right? No one really knows King Diamond the way they know Queen's Reich. Okay, let's, let's keep going here. I'm, I'm losing thoughts. Possibly them, but to me, and you might have heard of it, or this might be new to you all, Drive by Trucker's Southern Rock Opera is the greatest rock concept album is the greatest rock concept album. I mean, who wouldn't want to listen to a concept album about Leonard Skinner? Really? I'd never even heard of this at all. Although, Drive-By Truckers sounds... sound familiar for some reason. Uh, for the first uh, song to the last, this album does not disappoint. If you find yourself on a long road trip or just need to waste 94 minutes... Pop this album on your turntable and give it a spin. Dare I say it? Grab your favorite beverage, sit in your favorite chair, and press play on that album. I added that bit. Mike Buchanan says, It's okay, Ozzy, that you couldn't understand what Lemmy was saying. We all can't understand what you are saying either. Uh, Mike Buchanan says, Oh, Tracy, that's Tracy with an I. And, of course, it has the skull and crossbones over the top of the eyes. Uh, Tracy Guns, that is. Oh, Tracy Guns, late uh, to the party once again about backing tracks and whatever. So don't all bands pretend to play their instruments when they make videos? Just saying. 100%. That almost threw me for a loop when MTV started. And you know what, you know what got me onto it? Where I was like, oh, my God, they're right. Because I was very little. And I'm watching, and I and when I when I tell you I watched MTV, I watched it for 30 hours. Okay, I mean I watched it nonstop when the cable was on. Because back in those days, you didn't pay the bill. The cable man came over and removed this little this little tube off your cable box. But if you knew somebody, because they would usually just take the little tubes out and slide it in your box there, right? So if you knew someone, you just go over there. Just they go up the pole. There you go. There's your your uh, MTV back. But um, I always thought they were singing the tunes for whatever dumb reason. You're a dumb kid. And it was that song, Stop Me Up. Ooh, that Rolling Stone song. You have to stop me up, I never stop. And they're just, and he's wearing those god awful sweats in it, uh, Mick Jagger. Uh, but when I was watching him, I was like, oh, yeah, he's totally lip syncing it. Really bad. Anyways, let's continue on. Jesus, I keep cutting you guys off. Um, uh, Mike Buchanan says, so I can see some one uh, off. Uh, so I can see some one off shows with Michael Shanker joining the band. Not sure. OK, so he's talking about the return to Scorps with Michael Shanker. He, he can see one-offs with it, joining the band. Not sure if he needs to or ever will join the band, as he left them way back in 1979 or 1980 and has had a somewhat successful solo career. Yeah. Do you think, is he pissed when um, Blackout explodes, No One Like You explodes? Is, is Michael Shanker pissed at that moment when it's just, that song just cup? Pow, didn't it? Or am I just... That's when I heard him. I was like, No, I like you. I was like, Oh, I made the nice with you. Yeah, I was down. Uh, Mike Buchanan says, Talking of... Speaking of Dogs of War, the song has grown on me the more I've listened to it. But saying that doesn't sound... But saying that, it doesn't sound like Motley Crue that we've talked about before. When bands replace original members with new players and then the band sound changes, while I would welcome a new crew album, I can also wait. I'm sorry if I read that like horseshit. Mike Buchanan says, going to say this, Queensryche became a better band once Jeff was let go. They became heavier and have a more have a more sound like those albums of old. 
Please don't bring Jeff back. Boy, if Todd Latour ever put a comment on here, that is the place to do it. Right there on Mike's view. You know, if he ever listens to these old sons of bitches, that's where he just, my God, Mike, you got it. He does a great job. He's fine. It's good. Everything's, you know, it's. Okay, let's keep going here. Mike Buchanan, and speaking of bridges, there's a Korean thriller that's set to open in the U.S. on July 12th called Project Silence. Go check out the trailer on YouTube. Looks awesome. All set on a bridge where an unknown beast hunts down the survivors of a massive car pile up. Oh, shit, that does sound great. And once again, grab your favorite beverage, sit in your favorite chair, pop some popcorn and press play. He gave you a little twofer. That's what he did for you. Silton cheese is an English blue cheese. Hope that helps. Okay. Oh, Stilton. Yes. Because that was one of them cheeses. And now... It's uh, not a lot of jokes there, bud. Uh, now it's time for the Jive Talking Jokes of the Week. Uh, there's one here. Singing. Now he's giving me stage direction. I can show you the world. Voice out of nowhere. Okay. I don't... I, I, it's just, uh, voice out of nowhere. I can, I can show you the world. Voice out of nowhere. You have $2.68 in the bank. I can show you my driveway. I don't know. I don't know. Okay? You get in your heart, though. You, you, you pulled some heavy duty there. Heavy duty. Lunatic for Biscus. Coming in here. So, Shane, I'm sure that I'm not speaking for myself when I state... That we all enjoy and appreciate the musical interludes to your podcast and the groovy news. Thank you, lunatic. Finally, a lunatic that knows something. You're getting a thumbs up for that because compliments get you everywhere. Miss Althea coming in and she's got stuff to talk about. Let's get to it. The dumbstruck fool says, seemingly a lot this week on Thin Lizzy. Here we go. Thunder and Lightning Concert. I have seen it, but not for a very long time. I remember I deliberately sought out the footage after stumbling upon a 1984 interview with Duran Duran's John Taylor, in which he stated he went to one of their shows on that tour and how he admired Phil Lynott's pl playing style. Yeah, he does have a style. There's a comfort to it. There's a, I'm not really paying attention. I know what I'm doing here. I am compelled to revisit it now. Thin Lizzy was a cornerstone of the 1970s, early 1980s hard rock and very underrated in my opinion. I encourage anyone out there unfamiliar with them to explore a little bit. 1976's Jailbreak album was, is, epic. I 100% agree. Another thing I like about Phil Lynott's lyrics is there, there's a story. It's, it's almost like when he's singing, you're standing next to him. Like he's, he's, he's reliving the story. And you're just standing there next to him like, Shit, and then what happened? You know? I love it. Uh, Miss Althea says, all-time favorite concept album. All right, here we go. I honestly do not have a whole lot in this column, but I am going with a true classic, and that is The Who's Tommy. Yep. The deaf, dumb, and blind kid sure played a mean pinball. As far as what you were referencing with your picks, I want to say you were alluding to King Diamonds, Abigail, or them. Ding, 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 ding. And maybe... Uh, was it, what, was you going to put something else? Okay, so it is. My pick for the best concept album is them. I can sing what I believe to be. Now, if you, I was put to a test, I'm sure I don't know it, but I feel like I could sing every word of that record. I can air guitar solo every goddamn bit of it. 
I know the story. And then, of course, the sequel that I mentioned in that, where I said I'll give you my sequel, is the follow-up. Because that's right, Them has a follow-up record called Conspiracy. Where King... Grandma gets back, or was it King? Yeah. Well, spoiler, I won't spoil anything for you, but... He goes back, King Diamond goes back to the home, goes back to the house where them live. Anyways. Uh, uh, Miss, Al uh, Miss Althea says, Sharon! <laughs> I have mixed feelings on the Ozzy Lemmy cartoon. Do I sound very frothy and sloppy? I feel like I am. I hope now that I've mentioned that, that you're not just going to focus on that now. Focus on my words. I have mixed feeling on uh, Ozzy and Lemmy cartoon idea in, the, in that I find the Ozzy part of the equation hilarious, but the Lemmy part of it is slightly disrespectful. Maybe because he is not here to say anything about it. But what do I know? Hopefully, Lemmy would find it hilarious too. And I am going to assume his family gave the bl their blessings. Uh, Sharon will break some legs. <laughs> You're going to give me what I need. Or I'll break your bloody legs. You know, she don't she don't goof around. Miss Althea on Tracy with two eyes guns. I met him a few times and he signed a couple of things for me in the nineteen eighties. Still have them. Back then he was making he was making markings that were supposed to be bullet holes. Oh, boy. They were supposed to be bullet holes and or splatter from bullets. Oh, over his eyes. When I asked him about it, what the hell is this? His response was, that's so you know it's really me. Oh, okay. Then you won't mind if the local authorities contact you if I turn up missing? Or, really? You do. I don't know if you... Did you say all that to him? Where did it cut off? That's so you really know who I am. Okay. Then you won't mind if the local authorities contact you if I turn up Miss... Okay, I got you now. Jesus, I need to... I need... Miss Althea, I need to do better. The Shanker Brothers, Michael and Rudolfo. Don't care. Really. Although I did see Michael play with Rat, but the photo of Rudy with the pe with the piece looked uh, Rudy with the piece looked an awful lot like Michael Disparis. Who's that? If you start to question whether or not you know who he is, believe me, you do. See, she knows. His resume as a singer and actor is a hundred miles long. Michael Despares. Miss Althea on Jeff Tate, the Tate Man. Um, I was going to make a very, very crude joke, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold it in, guys. I'm gonna hold it in. And it wasn't rude about Jeff Tate. It was about Jeff Tate, but it wasn't rude. It was just a joke. I was going to say about a part of Jeff's body that he calls never mind uh, if he were to go back to Queensryche I would totally take Empire being performed in its entirety over Mindcrime any day I mean that's some could argue that, that uh, Empire was a, another huge banger. That had silent lucidity on it, which is you know, should take it over mind crime any day. I know I am in the minority here, and I suppose it also goes back to a topic of concept albums. To this day, mind crime has never grabbed me yet. I still listen to Empire often. Well, Good on you. That's the, that you can have that. You get to have that. Miss Althea, I was seeing aliens there, and it kind of distracted me. Aliens and so forth. 
Your run on the topic almost started to sound like the plot synopsis of Ultra 7X, a 2007, really? A 2007 installment of the song called Another, of, of the Ultraman series. See, I almost hit a line. And that I just started watching on Tubi, really. I'm always on Tubi. In an interesting and related tidbit, and by the way, Tubi is not some kind of dating app or something. It's a television app for cheap people that don't mind commercials because they don't want to pay for... In an interesting and related tidbit, the opening closing theme of the show is a song called Another Day Comes, performed by Pay Money to My Pain, a band request you recently honored on the channel. Yeah. They have degrees of separation from both Hide and... Okay. You're not going to do it? They have degrees of separation between Hide and Gazette. Shut up. Seriously. Anyone interested can go back and read my comment on that clip. All right. So you, you've got something there then. Um, uh, Miss Althea uh, on Mike B's movie recommendations for the Wasp Woman. Hell yeah. So she did, she checked it, she's giving it a hell yeah. One of my faves. It, it pairs well with 1960s The Leech Woman for a deliciously bad double feature. Don't you love double features too? Having a little night like that? And Mike, darling, not to pick, up, pick apart your tagline, but shouldn't you pop the popcorn before you sit in your favorite chair? It's got a nice roll to it. I don't know if we want to mess with that, but she is correct. But it does flow nicely. Anyone else out there a fan of Jiffy Pop? Yes. And getting excited over watching the foil expand. Yep. Back in the day. Is that even a thing? Can you get that? Is there any way? Half of it would be burned on the bottom. Your mom steps away for fucking one minute to answer the phone. Hold on. The cord, thank God the cord's long enough to get back over to the stove to keep shaking the jiffy pop. Uh, let's see. Anyone else other fan of jiffy pop? Yeah, watching the, yeah. Mike B's jokes. You said you have never heard it, be, you said you've never heard it, but you may or may not recall that you can tune a piano, but you can't tune a fish was the title of an R.E.O. Speedwagon album. No. It spawned the hit, Time for Me to Fly. Ah, joke within a joke. Oh. And I just butchered it by my, by my bad reading. A joke within a joke, and Mike is cringing. Fish, spawning, oh, forget it. Yep, she knew I was going to flop. Land of the Lost. I'm learning this is a deep and rich series. Land of the Lost, Miss Althea. And again, hell yeah. All seasons are also on Tubi. They are because I, I'm noticing now there's a season. It says three seasons on uh, Prime. But there's only two. One and three. And I want to watch season two. Uh, between, let's see. Uh, it's on Tubi. Rest in peace, Spencer Rick Marshall Milligan. Is he the fellow that just, who passed away this past April? Uncle Jack was lame. Between him and Chaka. Uncle Jack is... I don't know if I'm knowing what this is just yet. Uncle Jack. I know who Enoch is and all of that, but uh, Uncle Jack was lame. Between him and Chaka coming this close to becoming fluent in English, I was snark snarking all over my Saturday morning cereal by season three. Is Mike B. aware that Philip Paley, who played Chaka, was in a Roger Corman movie, question mark, and leaves it hanging? Yeah, this Uncle Jack thing is not ringing with me. <coughs> I've watched the first season. Or most of the first season. But it's kind of an ongoing story in a way, you know, and it's 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 pretty good actually. 
The way uh, Will hugs on Marshall, though, is just a little... He's always right up on him, you know? Anything else? Well, Dad! What are we going to do, Dad? If I was his dad... I, say, I mean, but, you know... What does he go by in, in the in the damn show? It's now it's now it's Will Holly and and uh, Sergeant Peppers. I can't remember, but anyways, he's really nice. Marshall. He goes by Marshall, but he's his name's Rick, and he's a nice guy. So he's not going to tell his son to quit grabbing at him all the time. But I would. I'd say, Will, get your goddamn hands off me. You're a grown you're a grown man now, son. You don't need to be hugging on me like you want to date me. He passed away. Uncle Jack was lame between him and Chaka. Yes, the English. I was snarking all over my cereal. Might be aware that Paley, Chaka, was in a Roger Corman movie. Leaves it hanging. Here we go. Bang. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um... I feel like sometimes I get, uh, when I'm watching Land of the Lost, I get distracted, just like I'm getting distracted right now. And so I got to go back an episode, and then I go, oh, yeah, okay, we're back on track. So uh, we got Cookie cookie Buns. What? Cookie Bombsta? Let's look at the stats. Let's see what we got going on here. We've got four comments and two hearts received. So I have given Cookie Bombsta, um, and you will be receiving, unless there's a rude words in there about me, you will be receiving that third today. You, Shane. Oh, we get a thumb. Too. There's three thumbs on this. Read more. Jesus. Okay. You, Shane, are the songbird of our generation and all generations. Billy Joel, Stevie Wonder, Barry Manilow, and Elton John couldn't hold the candle in the wind to you. Every dude wants to be you. Every chick wants to lay beside you. And listen to your C Casio magic. Oh, boy. Let's see. You're doing so good right now. Shane Diablo. Okay. Songbird. Concert for the masses. This is a request, but it's, it's a request for me for something I haven't done. A special edit video of consisting of 10 of your finest opening songs, song performances to watch and admire in one sitting... Now that is the album dreams are made of. I love you, Songbird. Thank you for always making me smile. That was beautiful. That gets you a heart and the old Songbird himself is going to give you a thumb. Sticky Doll coming in here. Shane, please don't misunderstand our ha-ha's. Okay, yeah, because they said something, and then they put a ha-ha at the very end, and I was a little worried about it. Our, on our sincere comment last week about your you inspiring us to do our podcast, you, the comedian, Orny Adams, oh my God, Orny Adams, I haven't said that name in it forever. The comedian Orny Adams and Dustin Hawkins from The Darkness are key players in that, any crap. Does Blabbermouth have quality control people that proofread their articles? Jesus. And last but not least, your Lemmy imitation sounds kind of like Mickey the crotchety boxing trainer from Rocky. And then I tried to do a, a crotchety Rocky trainer the other day and didn't get that right. Not, not to you guys. I'm not saying that about you, but I felt like I was getting that all wrong. So I got to shift my Lemmy to my Rocky. Uh, here's the th here's something crazy about Orny Adams. I mean, it's not really that crazy, but um, the first time I went, well, it's the second time I went and saw some kind of juggler, and he had a tape cassette and stuff. In fact, I think the first guy that I ever saw at a stand-up comedy club is one of those. Uh, the, what was the Tom Hanks movie where he was a comedian? The guy is on stage juggling and shit, and they just flash to him real quick. But Orny Adams. I didn't know anything about the Seinfeld, you know, you guys can all look this up, Orny Adams, Seinfeld, and everything else, the documentary, comedian, or whatever, uh, but I saw Orny Adams, and I fucking could not stay in my seat. I was, fuck, I was bawling laughing, he was so, 
And there's something about the energy of being in a room with other people and laughing and kind of being in that good mood. But Orny Adams, and I could never remember his name until I saw that documentary where Orny Adams is, you know, Seinfeld's popping up at the, all the places that Orny Adams is going to be, and they're cutting Orny Adams or whatever. He became kind of the bad guy of that documentary, and he wasn't a bad guy to me when I saw that documentary because that guy made me laugh my ass off. And I'll tell you, he made me laugh harder than Seinfeld ever did. But that's, you know, that's fighting words. Someone will fight you over that. Seinfeld's funny, but I, you know, I'm sitting seven rows in a small, small club with Orny Adams, and I am needing to breathe. You know, that feels so good when you cannot breathe, and you're laughing so good. Fantastic comment, as always, Sticky Dog. Go check them out at your leisure and pleasures. And then who we got down here? We got Bita Gargoyle. Beata. Beata Grilgok. That's something right there. You got eight, com your eight comments in and, and two hearts received. You will be getting that uh, that heart right here right now. She, uh, they gave me four heavy metal horns up to the sky. So that'll get you that heart. Uh, do it. Get out there. Take on, take on, take on your your problems. Take on your situations at hand. Take on your, you know, uh, don't let them get the best of you. Keep your chin up. Keep one foot in the gutter, one fist in the gold, as as, uh, as uh, Ricky Rackman would, would tell you to do. And uh, be the best that you can be uh, without being the meanest that you can be to others. How about that? Be the best that you can be and be the best that you can be to others. How about that? How about that? Huh? Let's get a tune. I just want to, I just want, you know, it's, it's, you know, you guys are knowing that I'm doing this on a Friday because it was the holiday and I didn't do anything for that either. I was going to do the podcast, but then I forgot. La la. Every time I hear that beat. La la. I want a song. Cruise in the streets. Guys, get in the car. Come on, get in the car. I said get in the fucking car. Come on. Thank you.